bet the board. What do you mean you don't bet? I mean, I don't bet. You know, I don't care. I don't. Wizard. I never have and I never will. Yeah, right. I'll bet you 20 bucks I can get you gambling before the end of the day. You owe me 15 grand, pal. Pay him. Pay that man his money. It's the Bet the Board podcast. God likes me. He really, really likes me. In the end, I wound up right back where I started. I could still pick winners, and I could still make money for all kinds of people back home. And why mess up a good thing? Here's Payne Insider and Todd Furman. Welcome into the Bet the Board podcast, NFL Week 12, Monday Night Football Edition, Bears Vikings preview coming later in the program. I'm your host, Todd Furman, joined as always by my steam colleague and co host, uh, the one, the only Payne Insider. And Payne, it's good to see that both you and I still have jobs this morning because there's one head coach in the NFL who's got to dust off that resume. I was hoping the season ended for me as well here. Uh, but not the yeah case. I can't fire I can't fire you you're you're talk. sticking around until the bitter end you you ain't getting fired whether you want to or not my friend we almost pulled the no show here if uh, the bills didn't cover the three and a half yesterday there, there would have probably been no Monday show I mean it was close I mean uh, Danny Amendola 58 yard field goal in perfect conditions can't put that game over the total 60 yard field goal in the rain and weather no problem for Jake Elliott just the nature of the season that continues to drive you nuts but uh we always start with good, bad, and the ugly on Mondays, but we did have some news that I think it's worth getting your opinion on. Frank Reich let go after just 11 games as the head coach of the Carolina Panthers for the second time in as many seasons. The Panthers part ways with their head coach in the middle of the season. I have to imagine this is a move you thought was coming, uh, but maybe not until after they'd at least finished the regular season. I think we talked about this a couple times in passing over the last month or so. We were huge Frank Reich guys early in the Colts tenure. I mean, we were backing them in tough situations, and they were coming through. And I don't know what happened to Frank, but it was ugly towards the end in Indianapolis. I'm shocked that was the hire in the first place. Doesn't surprise me with the offensive output that's currently going on there in Carolina. Gave up play calling duties, then took them back. And, I mean, they're averaging less than four yards per play post by this is a really really bad offense and I it's unfortunate for for Panthers fans because you had the offseason jolt brought in some veterans to kind of bide some time you go and get what was perceived to be at the time the number one quarterback you got a brand new head coach and now you're left 12 weeks into the season thinking you don't have your franchise quarterback you don't have your your head coach, all of the moves you made in the offseason to bring in some veteran parts, meh, they're not great. I mean, this is a team void of, of real talent, and it's going to be an uphill battle. But fortunately, you're in a division that at least provides a leeway to where I think you can make some moves in one offseason and be pretty competitive. Well, the other thing you mentioned, too, is that the Carolina Panthers, in their attempt to get Bryce Young, also don't have a first-round draft pick, which would have been in the top three. So acquiring talent in that regard gets to be a little bit more challenging. But you would like to see this group either burn it all down and build it back or figure out how they can apply a tourniquet to a wound that's hemorrhaging, which is that offense and a defense that ain't a whole hell of a lot better, even if they have dealt with a rash of injuries on that side of the ball. And we look at... You know, bad offenses, good defenses, what have you. As far as the good, the bad, and the ugly, what stood out to you so far uh, given what we've seen going all the way back to the Thanksgiving holiday? I think that's actually the perfect transition there because it feels so long ago with all the uh, the toxins we probably put in our bodies the last several days. But everyone, I would say excluding Packers fans, probably forgotten about Jordan Love having his best career performance, much to our chagrin. I was wildly impressed because if you had looked at some of the on-off field splits for the Packers offense without Aaron Jones, it was bleak. And so he was obviously out again dealing with the knee injury. But I thought Love showed the arm talent. We know he has, but he was throwing from all angles. 307 total yards, three touchdowns, 91 QBR, 126 passer rating. Not a single turnover-worthy play, which was huge. I thought the Packers' offense did a good job starting fast, something that they have obviously lacked doing this season. Love was was virtually good everywhere, and 
you talk about the the drastic difference in quarterback performance. Both of the quarterbacks were under pressure. Goff under pressure. Love was under pressure. 46% of his dropbacks, Love was under pressure, but he just unflappable, really. Finished QB5 and EPA plus completion percentage over expectation for the week. So I, I thought it was worth giving Jordan Love some some kudos there, even though the game was on Thursday and some of us probably have forgotten about it by this point. And quietly, the Green Bay Packers, now winners of three out of their last four, find themselves one game out of the final playoff spot behind the Seattle Seahawks. And they've already taken a little bit of money for Sunday Night Football. Well, they'll welcome in the Kansas City Chiefs, but their schedule opens up and there may be a path we didn't think was possible, not only for Green Bay going over their win total at seven and a half, but maybe being a little bit of a surprise entrant into the NFC playoff picture. Uh, You mentioned Jordan Love and his performance. While it didn't necessarily show on the scoreboard, kudos to the Pittsburgh Steelers. You break the 400-yard threshold for the first time in 58 games. You get both running backs going. Kenny Pickett throwing down the middle of the field, getting Pat Fryermuth involved with more than 100 yards. Look, I don't think everything is suddenly fixed in Pittsburgh. I don't think it's that much more than a true one-game bump. Uh, but at least for one week, the Steelers look capable on offense, even if their point accumulation didn't reflect how many yards they were able to grab against the Cincinnati Bengals defense that unfortunately is taking on water just as fast as an offense without Joe Burrow. And yeah, that game wasn't really close. On the field. No, not at all. And if you were putting the Bengals into some teasers through the uh, through the three and seven, very very fortunate to get that leg home. It was uh, a bludgeoning on the field, really. And I'm surprised it didn't translate to more points for the Steelers, just 16. But I think there was some things you can take away from that performance that that give you confidence, right? And you know, as, as humans, the moment you make a change and see immediate progress, your confidence is going to soar a little bit. And I think if you listen to some of the pregame pressers there throughout the course of the week, there was a concerted effort to get the better players involved. We'll just put it that way, right? That's basically what Faulkner and Sullivan were saying. Hey, we're going to get our, our key guys the ball and to be more aggressive and attack all areas of the field. And immediately, if you look at Kenny Pickett's intended air yards, along with his his completed air yards, substantially higher than season averages, you look at attacking the middle of the field. Certainly it helps having Pat Fryermuth back, but there were five throws between the hashes for, for Kenny Pickett, far more between the numbers. So now all of a sudden you're making the defense defend all areas of the field. You look at week 9, 10, and 11 combined, Kenny Pickett threw one singular pass beyond the line of scrimmage between the hashes. So just <laughs> that, a, that's a, sta- a that's a staggering number. Yeah, and you throw five in one game. So there was there was some drastic change. There was evident improvement. Let's see if you can carry this over. You certainly have a confidence builder here against a Cardinals defense, right? That that should be a a unit you're able to have more offensive success against here in week 13. Uh, I mean, you talk about a favorable upcoming schedule for the Steelers, Arizona at home, New England at home, Indianapolis on the road, and the Cincinnati Bengals at home before you finish with two road games against the Seahawks and Ravens, a team that's seven and four has no excuse over the next four games, not to be able to pick up three wins, get to the 10 win threshold uh, and be able to work a little bit more for AFC seating. Payne, we've been critical uh, of a lot of teams so far this year, and the New York Giants offense doesn't leave anybody bring with confidence. But don't tell that to Tommy DeVito, who now is second in overall quarterback rating amongst rookies behind only C.J. Stroud. But it's the Giants defense during this modest two-game winning streak forcing nine turnovers uh, that's opened some eyes. And, and you know what? To their credit, they played with energy. Mac Jones was a little bit generous with the way he handled the football, especially in the first half before he was yanked in favor of Bailey Zappi. Uh, but they're showing signs of being a more complete unit uh, for a group that's not getting a whole lot of offensive support most weeks. What's interesting is there was a lot of rumors swirling about Dayball moving on from Wink prior to this game. Dayball had a great quote on that, by the way. Sure. The only disagreement Wink and I have is who gets the last piece of pizza. Uh, when he was asked about it. So <laughs> that he did everything uh, he could to downplay uh, some of where there's smoke, there's fire in terms of disagreements and philosophy between him and what the defense was doing. Yeah, he's uh, he's a good guy, good personality. I, I am a little surprised you went with this as the good. And I think games like this are always tough to talk about because you can sound pretty freaking stupid to listeners. Patriots took sharp money. Right, open three went out to four and a half. Some very sharp money in the first half of this game as as well. If you watch it 
at no point does it feel like New England was going to cover anything but possibly write the opener. And you'll always get comments from casual fans, new betters, and they'll say, like, that's what you get for backing Mac Jones, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> this is a market, right? The, the market can mostly identify good players and bad. If Tom Brady was under center, you wouldn't have the opportunity to lay three. You'd be laying 14, right? <laughs> and so <laughs> when you start to, like, process the right way to think about some of these things, it, it changes for you. The Patriots' offense at its core is, is run by a below-average coordinator, has a below-average offensive line that's dealt with injuries, has poor weapons, poor quarterback play. The Patriots' turnovers are incessant. And that's really what yesterday was about. Because I go back this morning, download all of the data, and I start looking down to down. It was, it, I mean, they had plenty of opportunities. Let's not sugarcoat the, it. The, yeah, the, the, the Giants' defense wasn't all that good relative to to the opponent to make your list. I mean, the Patriots were a net positive 13% successful. Opportunistic the Patriots... is the only way I yeah. would describe the Giants' defense. Yeah. So I just, I mean, look, you're right. From a down-to-down -down success standpoint, the Giants' defense didn't didn't <laughs> remind you of the group led by Lawrence Taylor, Carlton Banks, and some of those other Giants Hall of Famers that are out there. No, I, and I look at this like the Patriots were a net positive 28% in rushing success rate. And so if you said before the game, hey, we got this battle of the quarterbacks. It's Tommy DeVito. It's Mac Jones. It's Bailey Zappi, like battling it out today. What's the difference? You'd probably have said, you know, the team that can run the ball better is going to decide things. The Patriots defense was actually substantially better than the Giants in this game. It's just, this is what we've seen all season from the Patriots. And so that's the battle I think a lot of professional betters are having because we don't discriminate. Right, we're we're trying to literally parse through some of the stuff, and for every person that says Mac Jones sucks, we're trying to find a reason to abstract value in that opinion. And then all of a sudden, you look at the down to down stuff, and you're seeing kind of a little bit of a, a blowout here of what should have transpired, and it doesn't happen that way in the scoreboard. At some point, you just kind of have to be like, you know, we. <laughs> We, we quit this team, um, and I think I think maybe we've, we've reached that point here. Uh, anything else you want to highlight in the good, uh, since you did a perfect job segueing into the bad, because I wanted to talk about the Patriots ineptitude, but I don't think we need to revisit that. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't anything that we left out in the uh, good category. Well, I, I see your list here, and I think some of them are, are worthy of, of talking about. You thought the Jaguars had a worthy offensive performance. I want you to talk about I, that. And, and I thought they... I'll give you my viewpoint because I watched every damn snap. Here's the thing with game. the Jaguars. I thought they moved the ball effectively uh, against the Houston Texans defense. You saw them get the play-action pass going. There were obviously way too many runs on first downs against the secondary that they could have shredded. You see the difference in terms of what you're able to get in productivity from Calvin Ridley when Zay Jones is out there. It's the some of the short yardage stuff that leaves a little bit to be desired. Doug Peterson is aggressive in certain aspects of the game in terms of going for it, but at the same time, he wants the punt and plus territory. So look, the yardage was there. Did it translate into points and a comfortable win for the Jaguars? No, not at all. But I thought it was good to see Trevor Lawrence kind of get on track. The problem for the Jags is they need better red zone execution, uh, and you'd like to see a little bit more out of Lawrence in plus territory, and not just using his legs, show a little bit more touch on the ball. There are way too many weapons there for this Jaguars team not to go out there and hang 30 on most opponents uh, on a weekly basis. Yeah. And, and based upon the yards, 445, which was impressive to accumulate, that translates to about 30 points. So I, I think these are always the tough games to assess because you go on the road, you win your division game, which now places you in first place. You're 8-3 and three overall. That's awesome. For a team that's owned you, too, to the Jaguars' credit, they finally at least got that 800-pound gorilla off their back, at least for one week. Yeah, and, and like, you know, I don't want to sound overly salty here because we went over 46 and a half on this game and, you know, closes like 48.2 and you're feeling pretty good. But you're like watching it just it still feels a little clunky, right? Still felt like something was missing for me out of this Jaguars offense. And, and I think you hit it perfectly. At one point, Press Taylor was 80 percent run on first down in the first half. You take out the 20 yard run from NTN. And, and him and Johnson went for 2.1 a carry on 26 attempts. It just felt like Jacksonville couldn't capitalize and put the game away. You know, you reach the Texans 22, you settle for a field goal. You reach the Texans 25, settle for three, get zero points on the trip to the one-yard line before the half. Apparently, 
the tush push wasn't an option. Uh, we, we see Trevor Lawrence healthy, multiple rushing touchdowns last week. Believe he got one earlier in the game uh, against the Texans. But then, you know, you're up six, you throw a pick in plus territory. Up seven, you have the ball inside the green zone, you settle for three. Then you're up 10 and start a possession at the Houston 46. You can't salt the game away. Came up with zero. Um, up three, you get to plus territory, your first punt. So it just it felt felt kind of incomplete despite all of all of the yards gained there for for Jacksonville. You wonder if there's a breakout performance coming if all of it clicks and this is a team that hits its stride given uh, what we've seen in the AFC. But you would like to see Trevor Lawrence take on a little bit more. I mean, we've seen it before with Doug Peterson. You know, just go out there, trust your quarterback. Now some concerns along the offensive line if Ken Robinson does miss time uh, dealing with the knee injury that kept him out for an extended stretch of that game yesterday. Uh, Deepak, I know, touches on that a little bit later in the program, so we won't play spoiler in that regard. So, all right, let's go into the bad. I mean, we gave Jordan Love his kudos for what he did on Thursday. Jared Goff on the opposite ends of the spectrum. I mean, looked like he was in a tryptophan coma when that game kicked off. And while the final stat line looked great, most of those numbers were accumulated in garbage time, more so than when the actual win-loss result was hanging in the balance. You think Goff went with morning turkey, about 10, 10 a.m. I think Goff looked like the, uh, he was out on feast. blackout Wednesday is what I think Jared Goff looked like when he was out to the first handful of series in that game. Maybe it was maybe it was turkey bacon. Um, I don't know if that contains tryptophan. You would know better than I would there uh, since you're the health nut. I The, the counting numbers look good. Goff's QBR was 15, worst of the season. You'd have to go back to the Patriots game last year where the Lions lost 29-0 for a worse performance from Goff in terms of QBR. Now, I'm not sure what happened to the Lions offensive line. That's a unit that you know was getting praise and we thought was, you know, potentially top 5 in the league. Goff was pressured on 52% of his dropbacks. I Listen, the Lions are a really fun team. It's great to see that they've made huge strides, and the strides just aren't in the metrics and the numbers, right? They're they're transitioning to the field, the win-loss column. They're still very incomplete. And I don't think the Lions' remaining schedule is daunting, but it's certainly tougher than we first anticipated, right? Minnesota's competent. The Broncos are clearly improving. The current form Bears provide a little bit more resistance. Probably should have beat them in their own building, you know, two weeks ago. So this is going to be interesting to see what the Lions look like down the stretch. But you you need good golf to come back. And it's crazy because the weapons are now healthy. Right? I mean, you have Amaran St. Brown who isn't dealing really with the the toe injury anymore. Jamison Williams is is back, right? He's he's fully acclimated now. Jameer Gibbs and Montgomery are your nice one-two punch in the ground game. So there really aren't any excuses for golf at this point. He's played better earlier in the season without this full complement of weapons. We thought when they all returned, this offense would just start to surge. The uh, silver lining for Lions fans, six remaining games, only one of them will be played outside in the elements uh, at the Chicago Bears Sunday, December 10th. So Jared Goff shouldn't wilt under any late season weather if he's able to get protection from the offensive line and operate from clean pockets. But what else disappointed you in terms of what you saw so far this week? I don't wouldn't call it a disappointment because we kind of sniffed it out and not having anything attached to the 49ers was, you know, it's always easy to, in hindsight, but uh, you, you probably should have been smart enough to play the asymmetric risk game there and say, hey, you know, this, this line's now seven. If Geno's out there, He's going to be less than 100%, and you're still at 7. You don't lose the value. If he's out, you know, the line's probably going to, to 9.5, 10 with an incompetent Drew Locke. So we probably should have played that asymmetric risk game and didn't. And then you saw Geno out there, and it's not good. I mean, we saw the final five, six games last season with some struggles. Gino has certainly performed decently in spots. Typically, they're when defenses are playing zone. And now you throw him out there. He's QB 20 in terms of QBR right now. The vast majority of that is is against zone defenses. But now he's, now he's not 100%. And that was pretty clear. And you start to listen to some of the broadcasters during that game, and they're like, hey, during during meetings this week with, with, uh, with us, during like media availability, He's 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 receiving treatment to his elbow. So you also have an offensive line that 
exceeded expectation earlier this season with all of the injuries, but they're kind of coming back to to what we maybe thought they were struggling to get the ground game going. We're really not able to get it going just based upon the early game state too. Found themselves down multiple scores. So you really couldn't get Charbonnet involved in the ground game. You really couldn't lighten Geno's load because of of the game state. And it just kind of snowballed there. And, you know, when you're playing the best team in football, they kind of, you know, the 49ers choked them out a little bit here. And I think you see the 49ers defense, while well, they can still be vulnerable in areas, have certainly improved with, with the addition of Chase Young. Gino is a great story, and when he's less than 100%, you're starting to see uh, it inch closer to midnight, and it might be time where Gino turns into a pumpkin as far as a starting quarterback and what he can do to raise some of the overall level of talent surrounding him with the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, anything else you wanted to highlight there before we get into the ugly and the injury bug that has bitten the Cleveland Browns even more than just sidelining Deshaun Watson for the entire season? No, we can transition if, if you're good and don't have anything. No, I mean, we can go right into the ugly. Uh, I mean, I had the Seahawks listed there, so uh, we were on the same page in that regard. So the Browns, as far as mounting injury concerns there, we know Deshaun Watson was lost a few weeks ago for the season. Dorian Thompson-Robinson exits the game against the Denver Broncos with a concussion. Amari Cooper banged up. Uh, Miles Garrett, never a great sign when you hear one of the top defensive players in the game say here's a pop in his shoulder. We'll figure out you know, if it's a broken bone, if it's something structural, or if he'll even be able to get out there as early as this weekend. But this Browns team has become an absolute mash unit, and maybe it means Sunday pain that we get the debut of free agent signing Joe Flacco under center against the Rams. And, and Denzel Ward missed, missed the, the Denver game with, with injury as well. So, yeah, I mean, just not only suffering injuries, but they're, they're to all the key cogs. They're to the premium positions that we talk about, right? I mean, pass rusher, cornerback, quarterback, <laughs> wide receiver. It's, just, it's not like you're losing, you know, an interior offensive lineman, right? Both tackles at, at one point have gone down. So uh, the Browns are struggling right now with injuries. We know what Chubb means to their offense. I'm sure this is on your look ahead line, so I don't want to jump too far ahead. But no, I, we can I don't segue it there. Can, I think it's the perfect I, opportunity I, to segue into where we're going. So I just, I, you can't, you, you, you can't trot PJ Walker out there, right? <laughs> you, you got Flacco off the scrap heap for a reason. You now get him integrated. You got a full week. I think this, this line's interesting. What was it last week? One, one, pick him. So. I don't get the five. <laughs> so not, not even with I, I just, 37 cluster to injuries see. along the uh, every starting position known to mankind with a total of 39 and a half. Yeah, I it's 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 one of those tough games. Right. And it's it's kind of the battle you have. And, you know, you, you have the ability to really look look stupid here. And we saw the Rams show an ability to to blow a team out last week. But. You know, this this was a three win team before Seattle blew the game. Unreal. Unreal. And then you know, you you, you play a, a Cardinals team that ain't very good. And so now all of a sudden you look at the schedule for the Rams, they have a little bit of life in the playoff picture. They're getting healthier. They win two straight and that schedule down the stretch is 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 more than manageable. Uh but in saying that's like I could only envision Brown's money coming in here. Because I just I don't know how you make a five point adjustment. You're certainly going to have to monitor some of these these injuries, right? Can can Garrett go? Can Cooper battle through? Like we've seen we've seen Amari Cooper over the years just be a freaking soldier battling through some injuries. And and do you get Flacco? So I mean I don't, I don't want it if it's PJ Walker, but <laughs> you know. Yeah, there we go. That was the transition. What else do we have for? Uh, I was going to say, you know, I think Jets fans are going, oh, can you get Tim Boyle into the ugly? No, Tim Boyle is exactly what we knew he was going to be. The pick six proved to be rather costly for anybody that had Jets first half tickets or first half under tickets. Uh, that might have been his best throw. That certainly wasn't on him. He threw a Hail Mary. It, it happens. I mean, the other throws now, I, those are bad. And I, I, I candidly, the question becomes here, like at, at, at what price? At, at what price? I mean, because the best unit on the field is still the Jets' defense against the Falcons. And, and I'm not sure the Jets can Congress, throw it against that Falcon secondary, which is the way I'm you not, carve them up. I'm not sure the Falcons can do anything offensively either. It wasn't some uh, great performance there. Dominant uh, pain. Dominant 24-15 against the Saints. 
where uh, Jesse yeah, Bates. That, ne- that's why you pay Jesse Bates. I mean, he, I think <laughs> yeah. he made all of his money there in one game, causing the fumble and having the pick six. He was the single. Uh, he was the one man EPA machine in terms of creating the pick six <laughs> and then taking points off the board for a banged up Saints team who I think finished the game uh, with one of the beer vendors at wide receiver after Rashid Shahid and Chris Olave left. They didn't want to get At Perry involved in a variety of different things. <laughs> but uh, you mentioned Here, here's here's what's interesting about this Falcons Jets game because this is one of the movers on the list. Uh, is that it, it wasn't, but we headline. can talk about it. Okay. I, I, well, I guess now it technically Tim, is one and a half they, to a field goal is a big move. So Yeah. They, they went to Tim Boyle because of the perception in the locker room. Because they wanted the defense to keep fighting. Tim Boyle is not better than Zach Wilson. No. No, he is not. And so that, that, that becomes the <laughs> interesting dilemma within this game. It's like, regardless of what you think of Zach Wilson, uh, the mobility, at least being able to like have some arm strength, uh, he's better than Tim Boyle. But I think they were going to lose the locker room, uh, the defensive side of the locker room, if if they didn't make the switch. And so here we are with the Tim Boyle experience. I think the best comment from a Jets fan on social media was that Zach Wilson could have just as easily thrown that pick six, but he was athletic enough to have made the tackle and not had it result in a pick six going the other way. 100%. So 100%. kudos to that Jets fan with uh, that astute observation. But we look at some of the look ahead lines and we can kind of run through these. Cowboys were a six point favorite. That number is ballooned out to eight and a half. I think I think you did an excellent job outlining what some of the concerns are offensively for the Seahawks. Both these teams playing on normal rest going Thursday to Thursday. Lions were minus three. They're now out to minus three and a half at the Saints. That number got as high as four. Saints injuries playing a big role in terms of why that number is there. Touched a little bit on the Steelers Cardinals. Steelers were three on the look ahead number. That number got out to (laughs) six. Uh, And And the market said, oh, no, 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 no. That's a bridge too far. We started to see some dog money on Arizona. So I wanted to get your thoughts real quick on this one. Just more the Steelers not covering with margin or buying extremely low uh, on the Arizona Cardinals in the wake of that 37-14 loss against the Rams. Yeah, it, it's it's again just the perfect synopsis of the 2023 NFL season where it's like the numbers suggest the Cardinals are the the side here. Um, at six and a half, the number felt a little a little wonky, and so we're down to four and a half at one of the sharper shops. Five and a half, we'll call it the consensus. What transpires from here, I I don't know. I you kind of want a team like Arizona at the peak. And the problem I'm having with Arizona is you got you now have some more defensive injuries. They play a zone defense that's very soft and, and not really good in in that state. The defensive line ain't great, so you're probably gonna have a Steelers team that's gonna be able to run the ball here. You, you know, you lost Kaiser White in the middle to injury. And so that was a big loss for the Cardinals. Kyler Murray seems very feast or famine since his return. There's not a lot of down-to-down consistency happening. You saw him limp around that game late, and they showed the ability to get blown out by a team that that probably should have four wins this season. And so now you're heading onto the road. Against and a resurgent Steelers offense, nonetheless. Right. Well, I, I, and I think, you know, when you, when you kind of plot this game in your head, you know, you got the Steelers' offensive improvement down to down. You didn't get it on the scoreboard, so you thought maybe, hey, you might get a little bit of a depressed price in the Steelers, but it, the, the market was just – the opener was maybe too sharp. Um, I At four and a half, I can't really think about the Cardinals. At, at six and a half at open or, you know, a cheap buy to seven minus – like, I, I completely understand it. Yeah, a little bit of a different dynamic as the market has since corrected Lions itself. Saints – Lions Saints is interesting. I'll just be quick on that one. Like, I think if – if you're just looking at like core numbers, there's no way on planet Earth you you would get to four there <laughs> on the Saints. But those offensive injuries that you mentioned, Michael Thomas is already on IR. You have Alave with the concussion. I'm not going to steal Deepak's job, but my guess is the data suggests most people, most players with concussions are are sitting now the the first week rather than playing. And then you had Shahid with the lower body injury. Derek Carr started to have red zone issues again, and that's why they were really leaning on Taysom Hill down there the last few weeks. Then he goes out and fumbles. So I also, you know, you have Marshawn Lattimore on IR, right, your top cover corner. And one thing that we've discussed, I think, on this show and ad nauseum throughout the course of the year, and I think we even said it in the preview, is like the defense is a little old, some of the Keacocks. And I, I don't. 
think the Saints defense is as good as maybe some of their their metrics. They've really played a soft schedule. So I kind of feel like three and a half is the right number, especially if the Saints wide receiver group is 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 a little bit banged up here. Um whereas again, if you're just like looking at the all encompassing twelve weeks of data, you could get yourself to to the Saints plus four. I just you know I I can't do it with some of the injuries. I mean, watching the Saints try and cover Bijan Robinson running routes out of the backfield. If Jameer Gibbs isn't targeted twelve to fifteen times in the game with extra time to prepare, the Lions aren't doing things wrong. And we'll know Ben Johnson needs a bounce back performance, um, given how that game was called and. He, clearly has to get more out of Jared Goff. Uh, one of the marquee games uh, that I know we're going to get to on the Thursday show, the 49ers-Eagles and NFC Championship rematch. You did see Philadelphia uh, open as a one-and-a-half-point favorite on a look-ahead number. Some of the other shops had it flipped to one, and one of the sharpest shops in the world has gone the hell with all of you. We're going to sit at three, and we're going to make sure that we take an Eagles bet before we drop this thing to two-and-a-half. Yeah, well... At three, certainly a, a different conversation. Um, I, 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 it's rare that I. Yeah, it's this rare is, this that is I really bad speechless. podcasting. I'm at three. Like I, I don't know if you can get there on the 49ers. At like one, understand it. At one point yesterday, and and we. This should have been our best bet on the damn podcast. I, I, I mean, we just are fucking that thing up left and right here um, on the NFL side of things. Three hundred and fifteen yards to ninety at one point yesterday. The, the Bills were outgaining the Eagles, <laughs> and we were in the third quarter of that game. Go back to Monday night. At one point in the third quarter, the Chiefs are outgaining the Eagles, like 230 to 70. They have been bludgeoned by some of the better teams in the AFC the last two weeks. They were beat up and should have lost to the Cowboys. And I understand, right, just winning games, winning gritty, relying on Jalen Hurts to, to bail you out and make some plays. 10 and 1, right? You're not you're not healthy, right? Goddard comes back eventually. It's going to open some things up for the rest of that offense, yada yada yada. But The Eagles are not playing well right now. But pain, they're 10 and 1. <laughs> but pain, they're 10 and 1. <laughs> they're not playing well relative to the record. Let's let's kind of put it that way. It does it it's better that Jalen Hurts looks a little bit healthier. Yeah. I will say that. Should- that that's a positive. But this is the game the 49ers have had circled. I I I can't lay three. Right? Yeah, I, I can't get to that number here. And I think at some point, you know, someone's gonna say, like, hey, I I can't get three in this game. Yeah, I'm not um, I'm not sure the market's gonna hold there. Now it is worth keeping in mind that Lane Johnson getting scratched uh Late on Sunday morning against the Bills with a groin strain, we'll want to monitor his yeah. status. Fletcher Cox yeah. also nicked up his Especially groin. Especially against those two defensive That's ends. That's what I was going right? to say. Matchup wise, not yeah. ideal if you're missing one of your key cogs along the offensive line. Yeah. So. Will be a fun one to talk about Thursday. Yeah, for sure. And while we mention injuries, like Payne said, uh, him and I can speculate all we want, but none of us have MD listed after our name. So that's why we bring in someone that does. You can follow Dr. Deepak Shona on Twitter at Sport MD Analysis as he provides all the injury perspectives from concussions to hangnails to busted toes. Are you injured or are you hurt? <laughs> when injuries occur in the NFL, you need someone to call on. If you hurt, you can still play. If you injured, you can't. Let's check in with Dr. Deepak Chona, Stanford and Harvard trained orthopedic sports surgeon and founder of Sports Med Analytics, the industry leader in data driven injury analysis. So, are you hurt or are you injured? All right, let's do it. Starting with Chris Olave. Now, he suffered a concussion during the game, and as a result, we have seen a few players come back at just one week, but most likely he would be out week 13, returning week 14, with no dip in his productivity. Then we have Miles Garrett. He said he heard a pop or felt a pop in his shoulder. He'll get an MRI today. Now, the key question when this happens is usually it's a partial dislocation of the shoulder, 
Now, the question is what's torn or broken? Sometimes you can have a fracture, and that's probably what happened to Deshaun Watson. Most of those cases put you out for the year for surgery. Now, if he doesn't have a fracture there, usually there's basically a tear, tear of the soft tissue structure called labrum, and that would allow him usually to play in about a week. So Miles Garrett, MRI pending, if there's no fracture, good chance to, that he does not miss time. Amari Cooper, now this one looked like a pretty severe hit to the ribs, and he got x-rays which were negative, which is good news. In most cases, there's a pretty serious chest contusion or rib contusion here, and players are generally able to play the following week, but with some sort of performance hit around about 15% for wide receivers. Justin Jefferson, he is, his team is suiting up tonight. He is still in doubt. He's questionable per the reports. Now, the way they've managed Justin Jefferson, we would have pretty strongly suspected that they would have had him do at least one full practice before fully returning him. And he hasn't yet logged that. So we're leaning towards Justin Jefferson sitting tonight and coming back week 14 after the bye. Cooper Cup didn't look like himself. He did have several targets, but not a huge amount of production against a relatively weak secondary. Cooper Cup ankle, this does look like he may have re-aggravated it during the game. He was limping again early on. So this is the type of thing that probably doesn't keep players out in most cases, but may impact his target number over the next week with a return to baseline cup performance, probably week 14 or 15. Then we have Damian Pierce. Now he returned, he only had five carries for 2.8 yards per carry. This is not really atypical considering it's a it was a high ankle and a at least moderate severity one based on his timeline. So with Damian Pierce, what you generally see is an improvement over the course of about the next three games back to his baseline efficiency. And similar story with Deontay Foreman. He was out this week with a re-aggravated low ankle sprain. And what you'll probably see with Deontay Foreman is a ramp up in his touches over the course of two to three games, especially because they have a deep backfield in Chicago. Then Minka Fitzpatrick, he missed this week, but has a very good chance to return in week 13. We'll be watching his practice reports closely. Most likely what we'll be looking for is three limited practices, in which case he'd have about a two thirds chance of returning. Kenneth Walker, he missed the game which is a pretty tough ask to have somebody try to play on the Thursday after sustaining a, an oblique injury. These usually don't affect performance that much when players return, and the average on them is about one to two weeks. So Kenneth Walker does have a good chance to be out there in week 13. The key, though, is that running backs do tend to see fewer touches their first game back, and of course they have somebody who they invested in heavily in Charbonnet. So we are imagining that Kenneth Walker comes back, looks like himself on a per-touch basis, but not probably the, sa the same workhorse load that you're used to. <clears throat> then Devon Achan, now he is dealing with what looked like a relatively mild re-aggravation of his prior MCL sprain, and the good news on this is that HN projects to probably return this week. They've been pretty conservative about how they managed him so far. And that's not unreasonable considering he's he's young. They're in position for actually the one seed right now. And so with HN, you you do the data would predict him coming back. Most players would come back this coming week. But it just remains in question how the Dolphins will manage it. So we'll know a lot more from their practice reports. He already logged a series of limited practices going into this week's game, but still missed. So we're thinking that he needs at least one full practice prior to returning. Aaron Jones looked like he had a pretty severe MCL sprain. Average on these is two to three weeks. They didn't put him on IR, which is important because it means they think they he'll have a chance to come back 
by that fourth game. And that's kind of what we're leaning towards, probably missing two to three weeks coming back right after that. T. Higgins, he has been out now for three weeks, and he hasn't shown any indication that he's on his way back. He hasn't started practicing yet. We do think he will start practicing this week. If he is suiting up for practice on Wednesday in a limited fashion, it bodes well for his chances to play this coming weekend. But with T. Higgins, we'll have to really just follow that practice report and see where he goes. When wide receivers come back from a pretty moderate severity or or higher severity hamstring, they do tend to have an efficiency dip per touch. Luke Musgrave is on the IR, and that of course means four games out. In addition, you these kidney lacerations, these aren't the type of injuries that would have performance impacts. We don't have a huge ton of data on them, but the data we do suggest that they don't have lasting performance impacts on players, which is of course good news. But with Musgrave, we will have to monitor this because it's not a guarantee that it's a four-week injury. Dallas Goddard, we're very strongly expecting a week 14 return here. And the reason being that they had the bye, plus they have three weeks, uh, three games that he probably will miss. And that would put him at five weeks from his week nine injury. Now, the average timeline on these fractures is five to seven weeks. And so five is pretty aggressive, but they are, of course, suiting up for a long playoff run. And we are thinking that that's why they didn't put him on the IR. So Dallas Goddard, we do expect to see him back relatively soon now. Demario Douglas was injured and left the game yesterday, but did not have a concussion per the reports. So if that's truly the case, then we are expecting him to suit up week 13. Cam Robinson left the game with a pretty real looking knee injury. He was very upset on the sideline and didn't really show any signs that he was close to returning. So with that alone, you couldn't really tell on video what his knee, what type of injury his knee sustained. But with his reaction, we are expecting a multi-week absence here on the average of two to three weeks. Titus Howard, he is dealing with a knee injury that sounds less severe. They're going to get an MRI today and then we'll really know. But with Titus Howard, I think he has a chance to play but in week 13, but we'll just have to follow his practice reports pretty closely. Fletcher Cox left with a groin strain. These are hard injuries to deal with, especially in wet conditions. And so Fletcher Cox, as a result, he left, and the average on these would be the one to two weeks. So most players would miss, but the Eagles are pretty aggressive about returning people fast. So we'll see how how he does. Again, most players would miss this coming week. Dorian Thompson Robinson left the game with a concussion. Average on this would be one week out, and then quarterbacks return the following week on average with no performance dip. Again, as we discussed with Olave, we have seen a few players recently clear the protocol in just one week, but again, that would still be an outlier. Michael Wilson, he has not been practicing. He has a shoulder injury that kept him out now a couple weeks, and Michael Wilson does project to return relatively soon because the average shoulder injury is being three weeks out would be an outlier so we'll see where he goes from here but but we'll know a little more from the practice reports on this one as well darren waller he is eligible to return week 14 we think this one might end up being delayed because he's older because he's had a history of now three severe hamstrings including at least two this year and multiple soft tissue injuries on top of it so darren waller Returning in a rush to a bad Giants team doesn't really make sense. So we'll we'll see how he does. We'll pro- but we'll expect this one to be a little bit longer than week 14. Rashid Shahid left the game with what sounds like a mild quad strain. Average timeline, one to two weeks. But these vary in terms of severity. So we'll see where Shahid goes based on his practice reports. They'll probably get an MRI today and we'll know a little more. Michael Thomas, he... And Marshawn Lattimore, actually, both a pair of Saints that are on the IR. The they're likely out four weeks. Lattimore is the more concerning injury here. With with Lattimore, the thing to keep in mind is that defensive back is all about 
reaction and cutting, but not planned cutting. So it's a little different than a wide receiver returning from a knee or, in Marshawn Lattimore's case, a high ankle injury. These are very tough. They do cause performance hits when players do return. So Marshawn Lattimore probably back after the four weeks, but usually not quite himself for six. Then Noah Brown, he is dealing with a knee injury that's kept him out now two weeks. He didn't practice at all this past week. The average, without having a lot of information, is about two weeks. So Noah Brown has a good chance by that data to come back this coming week. Again, he'll be very determined by practice reports and hopefully will log at least three limited sessions, which would give him a good chance to return. And then last but not least, we have Lane Johnson. He was sent out of uh, this game before he suited up. And this was a last minute addition to the report. They already got an MRI showing basically inflammation. So the area is strained in his groin. Interestingly, he did play last year with a groin injury and he's one of the best O linemen in the game. So you would have thought they would really try to push him out there if, if at all possible. But again, I think it's similar to what we talked about with Fletcher Cox. Wet conditions are very tough for groin strains. And the average timeline doesn't take that long on these. So we do think Lane Johnson has a good chance to return this coming week. And that's all for now. So I'll kick it back over. Well, I mean, Deepak agreed with you, Pena, on your assessment of the concussion protocol, though we have seen a player or two clear. So we'll want to monitor there. And I think he set us up perfectly, you know, mentioning what Justin Jefferson has been dealing with, the fact that he hasn't logged a full practice before we get into the breakdown uh, of the Vikings Bears here shortly. Yeah, I think he has the data, but I thought I saw him either send us an email or something he tweeted out that said basically guys that are in that concussion protocol, it's like a 12%. Yeah, it's extremely low. Week is it's extremely low. Are we... Unless you're Dylan Gabriel. Let's... Yeah. <laughs> that one hurt the boys. I know that one. Um, I thought they were going to battle back. They cut it to like 14, had some momentum heading to the fourth, but that one... When uh, you're a 10-point dog and you score 45 points, you should cover 95% of the time. <laughs> And, and there were better numbers throughout this. Isn't that open 13? 13, 11 and a yeah. half. I mean, you name it, yeah. they were out there. Mike Rook. Jeff Levy to Mississippi State just taking paychecks, which is which is great. I mean, you can't win at Mississippi State, but, I mean, you set your family up pretty you go well. Out there, taking, you go out there. Taking an SEC check. You can go six and six uh, every year with three non-conference cupcakes. Hope you steal a game or two against Vanderbilt with the newly configured SEC and then hope you use it as a launching pad to uh, something bigger and better. Yeah. I mean, this is life. People take jobs for money. Uh, that, that they do. <laughs> right. that, that they do. And uh, I think being a head coach in the SEC pays a little bit better than an offensive coordinator at Oklahoma, especially when you don't necessarily see eye to eye with your head coach. More on that potentially later in the week. Um, all right, Vikings Bears. Uh, we're looking at the Vikings right now, a three-point favorite uh, at a lot of shops, a soft three at some of the sharper shops out here in the desert and even in the offshore realm. We've seen this total leak down a shade from as high as 46 on the open. We're now looking at 43. We kind of teased Justin Jefferson not logging a full practice. The Vikings have a bye coming up. They haven't officially ruled him out, but Diana Rossini's report on Thursday said that Justin Jefferson was going to be out for this game. When you look at the way these two teams have performed, the Vikings have beaten the Bears in five straight. It's the longest win streak against their division rival since the early 90s. The Bears come into this contest fresh off a 31-26 loss at Detroit. They became the first team to lose a game this season with 10-plus point lead in the final five minutes. They're also now the only team to lose twice this year when leading by 12 or more at any point in the game. Vikings, on the other hand, just couldn't get that late stop against the Denver Broncos. First meeting between these teams, the Vikings won 19-13 at Chicago. Vikings had just 220 total yards, but won the turnover battle 3-1. to Justin Fields started that game, didn't finish. That's where he dislocated his thumb. Tyson Badgett, that was when he endeared himself to all Bears fans that were out there. Kirk Cousins finished that game for the Vikings, 21-31 to for 181 yards and a touchdown. The Vikings, meanwhile, have been the hottest thing in the NFL in terms of ATS success, covering six straight games. All six of those covers have come without Justin Jefferson. We can talk all we want until we're blue in the face. Uh, I know there are a lot of folks that have bet this blindly, but Monday Night Football, if you blindly bet the under, you'd be extremely profitable this year, going 12-1 and in that realm. Meanwhile, the Bears looking to try and finally win a division game, losers of 12 straight and if they've gone just two and 12 ats in their last 14 divisional games overall but pain 
These bears seem to be trending in a positive manner and may have an avenue for success, knowing professional bettors took the four and took the three on Chicago earlier this week. So you mentioned trending. It's probably best to start with the Bears' defensive improvements, the Vikings' offense. And I I, I think Kevin O'Connell deserves some credit for having to you know, shuffle three different starting quarterbacks through the lineup while also having to deal with, you know, the aforementioned uh, Justin Jefferson injury. He's been out for an extended time. And and the Vikings have managed to have a middling offense in, in terms of efficiency. I don't think the Bears' defense is great by any stretch, but getting substantially better, right? They're improving. Above average in EPA per play allowed since week five. Number one run defense over that stretch. Really, the Bears' run defense has been solid all season. If you just look all 12 weeks, top five in EPA per rush allowed and rushing success rate. So there's probably not a ton of great production on the ground for Madison and Chandler. Vikings' run game certainly stepping up in class. They got a little bit of efficiency out of those two guys last week, but that was against number 31 Denver. Ty Chandler and Madison probably will find a touch more success in like pass catching roles tonight, I would think, than than running it. So just kind of a little bit of a step up in class for the Vikings offense, who you know have played one of the five easiest schedules of defenses this season. Shocking, you can kind of say that when you're playing the Bears defense, but it's kind of where we're at right now. Um, it does sound like the rookie starting corner Tyreek Stevenson is going to miss the game for Chicago. Hasn't had a great year kind of being thrown into the fire, but was coming off his best performance of the season against the Lions. So you would have liked to see, you know, Stevenson be able to build off that. Otherwise, the Bills, the Bears defense, pretty, pretty healthy tonight. I think, you know, without going where everyone probably thinks I'm going, right? Like long term, all encompassing, not being like a prisoner of the of the fleeting moment. Our thoughts are pretty well documented on on Josh Dobbs. And I think if you pay attention to the market, you know, the most sophisticated bettors are telling you in some form or fashion their opinion on Josh Dobbs. He, he started the home game against the Saints. Saints and under money came in. Started on the road at Denver. Broncos and under money came in. And despite the majority of the action on Minnesota tonight, Todd, you said it perfectly. Bears and under money has come in. Um, you know, we saw basically a peak opener of, of 46 down to... 43 right now at, at at pinnacle generally speaking the guys with the largest influence in the market have, have faded the vikings again here right and, and you know they've gone under all three games with with josh Dobbs starting they've they've backed you know the opponent and and we saw at four a touch and then at three and a half was really the the larger position here on, on the bears now even with better secondary health the part of the bears defense you want to attack is through the air Right, the Bears don't get a ton of pressure either, so I, I think Dobbs should be somewhat comfortable. I don't think he's going to play a horrific game here. Um, you know, despite spending like gobs of money on linebackers, the Bears still have have struggled mightily to defend tight ends. So T.J. Hawkinson is probably a threat tonight. Eighty-one percent of targets to tight ends have been caught against the Bears. Uh, bottom seven in EPA allowed to the tight end position. So you get Hawkinson involved, make some easy throws for Dobbs. I think there's a path, right, for for Dobbs to be pretty competent tonight. What's just wild for me, Todd, is like play to play, quarter to quarter, half to half. There's just been so much variance with with Josh Dobbs. It's it's kind of tough to pinpoint what version of him, you know, you're going to get. And I think we talked last week ahead of that Denver game. It's like for, you know, 11 minutes, he's he's you know three times better than Patrick Mahomes' career arc, and for. 49 minutes he's he's worse than Josh Rosen so it's just it's very difficult um to kind of peg what Josh Dobbs is you know from from basically play to play again with the Josh Rosen slander I mean the guy's out of the league already and he's still catching strays here on a bet the board podcast on a Monday morning it happens it happens other side of the ball when we look at the Bears pain um this is an offensive line that was much maligned early in the season it's gotten significantly better you look at the pass rush and Pass block, uh, sorry, the pass block and run block win rate uh, in terms of ESPN, the numbers are outstanding. Justin Fields back last week looked to lead a 
offense that had some big play potential. Uh, I mean, clearly DJ Moore much more effective with fields under center than what we saw with Tyson Badgen. Khalil Herbert returns from IR and wasn't the starter last week, but Deontay Foreman gets hurt. Herbert steps in. And I think this is a week where his ability to catch balls out of the backfield can provide a unique dynamic against the Vikings team that wants to heat you up. And when you look at Justin Fields, uh, look, from a yards per attempt standpoint versus the blitz at the top 10 rate so far this year. But at the same time, his quarterback rating, nothing to write home about. So if the Bears are going to hunt the deep ball, they're going to put themselves in harm's way. And Fields was sacked five times before he left that game with injury the first time around against this Vikings group. You led me in in a perfect part here. Kind of, I think there's some, some level of variance, right? Because the very first thing you're going to always look at when you're facing this version of the Vikings defense with Brian Flores pulling the strings is how does the quarterback handle the blitz? And in the first meeting back in week six, when these two teams played, Brian Flores sent blitz on 81% of the Bears' dropbacks. I would not expect that high of a number tonight, but Minnesota leads the league in blitz rate at around like 47 48%. Fields didn't handle it overly well before leaving with the thumb injury, and Fields hasn't been great this season against the blitz either. Graded out QB 27 among 36 qualifiers. However, the larger sample size, right? Justin Fields' three-season career numbers, he's been really solid against the Blitz, to your point, and yards per pass attempt and touchdown rate, both substantially higher when, when under duress. DJ Moore has basically been the safety blanket for, for not just Justin Fields, but all Bears quarterbacks when Blitz this season. 31% target share. Fields and Moore kind of have been on the same page recently. You're looking at 23 catches for 457 yards and five touchdowns for DJ Moore and Justin Fields' last three starts. So you certainly got to get him the ball early. Ground game for Chicago is really interesting. I think you hit this perfectly. We had questions about the Bears' offensive line coming into the season. And there's a wide range of opinions still and that individually the key cogs along the Bears' O-line haven't graded out well. And if you look at some of like PFF's numbers, still have the Bears offensive line number 20 coming into the week. But collectively, they're playing a little bit better as one. Burton got healthy. Nate Davis returned last week. So you have your your full complement of five based upon who's playing a little bit better. They're rotating the center. Uh, But the Bears are second in run block win rate. They're also sixth and line yards created, and that's led to a top-10 schedule-adjusted rushing offense for Chicago. Now, Justin Fields, obviously his legs uh, help greatly in some of those efficiency numbers. It sounds like Devontae Foreman's out tonight, so it's back to Khalil Herbert and Roshan Johnson. The Vikings' run defense is a little wonky. It's tough to gauge, right? They send a bunch of blitzes, so they create some negatives from time to time and with those run blitzes they've also done a really good job ex- uh, you know preventing explosive runs so you look and they're top 10 in both EPA per rush allowed and schedule adjusted rush efficiency you can at times though stay ahead of the chains picking up 4 yards a pop because 40% of runs against the Vikings have great successful that's an above average league grade allowed so you know there's some paths for relative offensive efficiency for the Bears tonight. Again, very you know sharp money on Chicago at at you know four minus twenty and and, and three and a half. I you you want to see them get over the hump, right, and close the game out. Beating Carolina at home obviously means nothing after what we've seen recently. Beating the Raiders at home doesn't mean much prior to to you know this rejuvenation they've had there beating the commanders means nothing go into your division rivals building and close out a game that really you know greatly hinders the vikings ability to make the postseason and i think we'll start truly believing some of the improvement we're we're seeing in the numbers here for chicago i mean look i know bears fans don't want to hear it because i'm sure on some level or multiple levels with a bye week coming up next week they'd love to go zero and six down the stretch finish the season at three and fourteen Uh, and preserve some of those draft positions. But you look at the upcoming schedule, not just tonight, but the remainder of the season, they can very well play spoiler uh, in the NFC and maybe accumulate a couple of wins if they're buttoned up. As Justin Fields knows, he's got to put his best on tape, whether it's for the Bears or to figure out his next landing spot, potentially as a starting quarterback if the Bears elect to go away from him in next year's draft. Yeah, the Bears 
Bears fans were hoping for a lot of losses. They were hoping for one in Ann Arbor on on uh, Saturday, I'm sure. Well, they still may get their wish there. We'll see how all that whole situation unfolds. But you never know. They could get another year of the Eberflus experience over there at so- Soldier Field along the shores of Lake Michigan. You can follow Payne on social media at Payne Insider. I'm Todd Furman. You can follow me there. You can also follow the podcast at Bet the Board Pod. Payne, anything else you'd like to share with our listeners uh, before we reconvene on Wednesday with College Football Championship Week? No. Big Wednesday ahead. A lot of uh, great games on the docket there for Championship Week. And then back Thursday, the slate isn't great overall, but looking forward to talking 49ers-Eagles. Yeah, it should be a fun one along with uh, a little bit more intrigue in the Sunday night affair as well. And suddenly two teams keeping their heads above water in the AFC of the Denver Broncos and the Houston Texans. Best of luck on Monday Night Football with all of your investments, wherever they shall take you. We'll be back with you on Wednesday, joined by Brad Powers, as always, to break down all things conference championship week as we begin to get even that much more clarity in the quest to be one of four teams in the college football playoff. Best of luck tonight, and hopefully we'll see you at the window. We hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of Bet the Board. Make sure you follow Todd and Payne on X. Todd is at Todd Furman. That's T-O-D-D-F-U-H-R-M-A-N. And Payne is at Payne Insider. That's P-A-Y-N-E-I-N-S-I-D-E-R. Don't forget, our weekly newsletter comes with an additional best bet. Have that delivered to your inbox by clicking the link atop the podcast show notes. And most importantly, subscribe and download Bet the Board. We're on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Wondery, YouTube, Google Podcasts, and all your other major platforms.